Well, I was asleep in my bed and my husband was in New York at a hotel on Thompson Street. And I got a phone call at about, I guess it was six o'clock in the morning here. And he goes, I know you're sleeping, but wake up right now and turn on the TV. A plane has gone into the World Trade Center. I'm on my way there now. So my husband's an artist and his best friends all lived on Duane and, you know, two blocks away in another direction. And they were all running to the World Trade Center. And they were, they were both artists and photographers. One of his best friends was the, uh, the photographer for the Norwegian newspaper. So curiosity, you know, they were, they were drawn there. So uh, as I turned on the TV, the second plane went in. And I, I you know, of course, we were all in shock. So he, um, he said, I'm in a deli. I'm, gro I'm going into a deli just to get some orange juice. We've been down here for a long time. You know, we were trying to figure out what's going on. No one knew. They thought it was a, a plane had accidentally gone in. Well, by the time the second one went, on, went in, things were dawning on everybody slowly, as we all remember. I, was, I think I was watching the Today Show. Mm -hmm. And then um, as he walked out of the deli, he said, with this orange juice and something to eat, uh, that's when the rubble, the building has, had come down, which I saw on TV. He was running from it for blocks. He said he ran, he saw people fall, and he was just running as fast as he could. And um, and I lost him for about an hour. And so uh, a lot of his friends were not only artists, but were in the, were in the World Trade Center uh, or worked there or didn't happen to be there. But as people were gathering at his friend's apartment, uh, his loft, people weren't showing up. You know, one at a time, you know, people weren't, they were, people were looking for this guy and looking for this girl and looking for this guy, but everyone was gathering. And then I called to see if I could find him because his cell wasn't working and, and his friend Andre said, he's just upstairs on the roof. But he didn't know where he was either, but he didn't tell me that. Then I got a phone call from Christian, my husband. So I was rejoicing and, you know, I didn't let myself go to any horrible, tragic place, but I was just frightened. Like, where is he? Then, you know, our uh, AD, Katie Garretson, kept our, from Fraser, our assistant director, she called a couple of times to check in. And so she said to me, did you find Christian? I said, yeah, we talked, he's fine. And um, she said, well, I gotta go, but I, I'll probably be calling you back. No. but I didn't know what that meant so then she called back and told me that David and Len had been on that first plane and I was just in so much shock that I you know you just were it was just one as we all felt it was just one image and piece of information after the other it was so huge and unbelievable and that still is David Angel was uh, the Grub Street were the name of the three producers. David Lee, Peter Casey, and David Angel were the three guys that created Frasier. And I had known them for a long time because I, I uh, had gone, I had really gotten a, kind of a long way in the auditioning process for Wings. And then I did a series next to them. And I knew them and David Angel said the funniest thing, they made me bring like clothes because they wanted me to go to network. So they made me bring a bunch of clothes up to their office so they could help me decide what to wear, you know, for wings. And I had these red flats, you know, and he goes, you know, where did you get those? The Vatican? And, um, and it turns out his brother was like, is like the Archbishop of Connecticut. And, um, he was very funny and he, he, um, he wrote my funniest line that never made it to the air. He wrote, um, there was an episode on Frasier where Roz, Mercedes Rule and its character and Frasier had had sex on the air on the radio and everyone was trying to figure out who it was that he was having sex with and they and she was our boss so she didn't want that out there and I'd sworn to him I wouldn't tell so they were also trying to introduce a new character that was supposed to be my friend at the station a girl a woman character and so this woman this the actress that played the part was fantastic and we were having the best time and she was she said to me come on come on you got to tell me you got to tell me and I'm like I can't I swore to him I wouldn't tell and she goes, come on, I tell you everything. And I go, oh, you sat on that penile implant for two weeks. <laughs> and, uh, and that, so I'm like, thank you, David. You know, but then it went away because I do think in the end, he was like, he was probably the one that knew right where that edge was that you couldn't cross over, right where that line was. But, um, but he was really great. And he, um, 
at his memorial service, I found that he actually coined the phrase boink because, um, which I remember hearing Denzel Washington say in um, St. Elsewhere, they're all lost because there were all these, um, you know, they'd rebuilt the hospital and there was a serious thing going on and he stuck his head in the room and went, who do you have to boink to get out of this hospital? And I heard that David Angel at his memorial service had written that and I think everyone used that term a lot on Cheers and he was a really funny, classy, kind, cool, smart guy, you know, and Lynn, his wife was, um, you know, she spent tons of time with kids and she did a lot of work for uh, orphans and a lot of work for libraries and books and reading and they, they didn't have any children of their own, but they worked for kids. They just both were very... Uh, they thought a lot about other people and they did a lot for other people and they were just really they were really angels and 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 um i felt like kelsey kelsey said many times i heard him say it on tv like on leno different places and i and, I, and he said it on the set that he didn't want to um you know personalize our loss in such a way that we publicly looked like we didn't understand that this was a part of something much bigger you know, and uh, so we never did. And I always, you know, there was just one day on the set where we all just said, we've never talked about it. We've just never talked about it. And we sat down. On, I remember there were all these rugs for some reason in, Kel in Fraser's apartment. And we all sat on these rolls of rugs. And we just talked and for hours about David and Lynn and how we felt and how we feel and how much we miss them. And, and after that, I felt a lot better because I felt like we had not just done a memorial and done all those things you do but like really acknowledged our tremendous loss sounds like he was a real heart and soul for the show I feel like he was yeah I mean there, it wouldn't have been the same show without any person on that set but he was such a wonderful guy I think just that one that, you know, everybody had a voice in that show and that was part of what was really fun about Fraser was Everyone had a chance to talk. We all could say what we felt and give ideas and throw things out there. It didn't <laughs> make it all the time, but you could talk. You could say it. With him, his voice was so specifically, like I said, he just, he could take it right up to the edge. And um, But I think he always was a, had great taste, like really great taste, like, you know, knew right where to stop. And, um, and I don't think we ever crossed the line after that but I don't know if we ever got right up to it again <laughs> in that great way well I remember a story that John Rando I worked with John Rando recently who won a Tony for directing You're in Town and they were opening that week I think You're in Town was open and he said that everyone was sitting there uh, not knowing what to do you know and he said we're going on because that's our job and they did and that day that it happened, I was sitting on my sofa, you know, watching TV, and I just kept falling asleep because I think I just was in that weird thing where I, I just didn't want to deal. And David Hyde Pierce, speaking of, you know, called, and I had been working on this benefit for the National Breast Cancer Coalition for about, we'd been working on it for like six months intensely. It was a cabaret. They, we still do it. It's about, they're going to do the 11th one in October. And David and Jane were doing a number together, and it was a cabaret. And Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman were directing it. It was very, it was very body. It was like come support our breasts, that kind of thing. And um, and I was like, I don't know if I if we knew about David yet, but David Angel. But I was talking to him, and I'm like, and I was a broken record because I was just trying to keep this thing going, you know. But now that this weird horrible thing had happened I just said David I know this sounds terrible but what do I do about late girls I mean should I what do I do it's in two weeks you know and he goes Perry I have a benefit for Alzheimer's in New York City the Saturday night before it we always did on Monday night I will be in New York City I will be walking down the street for Alzheimer's and I will fly back to LA and I will be on stage with or without rehearsal for the Breast Cancer Coalition we're all gonna be there don't you worry it's all gonna happen. And I just knew that he was right, and it did. And it was an amazing night because it was the first time a lot of us had gotten out. And Jennifer Lewis was in the show. This was two weeks later after it happened, but I remember Mark and Scott, she was shooting something and she ran over, she was shooting that 
show that she did, the Strong Medicine, I think. And she ran over to the stage, which we were at the El Royale, that's not what it's called, but it's on Wilshire, we're at a little theater. And she ran over and they met her in the lot, they met her, but we met her backstage and she was getting her clothes on and they go, you're gonna sing Let There Be Peace on Earth at the end of the show. That's how we decided to end the show. And um, she goes, okay. And after all these people marched around, I did Mazeppa. We were all like, you know, just as horrible and body and irreverent as possible. She came out and sang Let There Be Peace on Earth, it just spontaneously, you know, and just people's talent and their heart, you know, and then the whole audience, we all sang God Bless America, and that was spontaneous. And we were, it was just, I'm just, all I'm saying along the lines of what you're asking is, Maybe what entertainers can do the best in these times is help you find that in you, you know, or your your song, your heart, your feelings, so that you can express yourself too, you know, and that's really helpful. I just recently saw this um, documentary about the Panama Canal and the building of the Panama Canal, and it really stuck with me because um, I saw what America, how Americans saw themselves during that time. And the, you know, just the, can imagine it and can do it, you know. And I think one of the things that 9-11 has taken away from us is that feeling. And, um, and that's what they wanted to take away from us. And I think that's reflected in our, in the economy crash and just all the ways that we don't give ourselves credit for what we can do. And, um, you know, I know we're. I know we can build back, and I know we can be what we were when we were building the Panama Canal, and you know maybe through something like that, you know, going to the moon, or my two kids both learned how to ride their bikes yesterday afternoon. <laughs> you know, we can. Yeah, it was really cool in an hour. So I just want to say I that um, I just don't want David and Lynn to have gone through what they went through and what all those people went through, the first responders, the people in the Trade Center, the New Yorkers that are living around it and with all of the things it has caused them and just all of us. I don't want it to have happened and I don't want them to win.